Good evening. Welcome to this talk about uh, quantum hardening. Um, so before we start, let me introduce myself um, quickly. Um, I'm Carolyn Warner. I'm a software engineer working for Adobe. Um, and besides the work I do for Adobe, uh, I work as a freelance engineer, mostly doing C++ and Rust work. And in the course of that, one of the things I was asked to build was an HSM. Um, a hardware security module, and later I was asked to outfit that with, um, hopefully, um, quantum-hardened technology. Um, and um, the research I did is basically what I talked about, uh, what I'm going to talk about today. Right. So, um, this is going to try to be an introductory talk, so it's hopefully suitable for um, engineers who haven't done that much with cryptography yet, who want a basic introduction into how this works. Um, so I'm going to start off by introducing some of the um, basic concepts of how to construct a cryptographic protocol, and then later move on to how those can be attacked by um, quantum computers. Um, and finally, we're going to discuss how you can react to that and actually um, quantum harden a cryptographic system. So, um, this is about quantum hardening. Um, it is not about um, quantum computing. Quantum hardening is the study of how to secure um, existing cryptographic protocols, existing cryptography against attacks from quantum computers. Um, quantum computing is the study of how to use quantum effects to build computers while quantum cryptography is about the study of how to use quantum effects to build cryptographic systems. So we're talking about the first that is run on normal computers. It involves no calculations done by quantum computers. Um, just making sure our crypto doesn't break as soon as quantum computers become practical. So before we can start introducing how to how how um, today's cryptographic protocols are built, um, we have to talk about cryptography itself. What is that? So in this example, we have Alice who is trying to send data to Berta, uh, and it's a particularly important message. I like your cat ears. Nobody should hear that. Uh, it should be very very well protected, obviously. So. We would like to use cryptography to make that happen, to make sure nobody can listen into that. And that's what cryptography is for. So one important property cryptographic systems usually have, or often have, is that they encrypt data. So that anybody spying on a transmission or has access to data um, cannot read that data. It's, however, not the only property you would like to have. Um, Take, for instance, the example of you sending um, a wire transfer to your bank. You're using online banking. You're trying to wire some money to somebody. Another thing you'd like not to happen is that the data is tampered with because your money might go to the wrong address. And that shouldn't happen. So um, that's another property we'd like that is um, tamper proofing, making sure your data cannot be tampered with. And the third property we'd like to have in a good cryptographic system is um, authentication. We'd like to know the data is really coming from me because otherwise an attacker could send an encrypted message, but they could just um, act like they're me and they could still send an encrypted message and send wire transfers in my name. So these are some of the basic properties we're going to look at today and how to introduce them and how to make sure they keep working um, when quantum computers are there. So the first, um, first we're going to look at some uh, archaic ciphers because they illustrate the point of, on a very fundamental level, uh, how encrypting something can work. And the thing we're looking at here is quite old. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's roughly 2,000 years old because it was invented by Julius Caesar. It's also called the Caesar cipher. In the Caesar cipher, you take, oh, excuse me. In 
In a rotation cipher, um, you assign every character a number. For instance, in our example here, we've assigned spacebar a 0, a a 1, b a 2, and so on. And now to encrypt your data, you just add a constant offset, you just add the key, which in our case is 4. So space becomes D, A becomes E, B becomes F, and so on. And to reverse that, you just subtract the key again. So um, D becomes space again, E becomes A again, F becomes B again. Um, we have an example of how that, that looks like when you encrypt our actual text. I like your I like your cat ears become something quite unintelligible. And so, yeah, this, this is encrypted. It's very hard to read. Nobody can read it, so that is encrypted. But is this actually a secure scheme to encrypt data? So can we crypto analyze it and find a way of reversing that encryption without knowing the key before? Of course we can, because there are just 27 keys. We can just try each and every key until we find the right one. Uh, and we'll know which is the right one because um, um, we'll see text that makes sense. So that, that attack is called a brute force attack. Um, and that's just trying every possible key until you find one that works. Um, and you can do that quite quickly um, Trying 27 keys doesn't take that much time. Let's look at a different cipher, one that's quite similar, a substitution cipher. Um, and here we don't add a constant offset to each character, but we're still replacing one character with another. Um, and basically we just shuffle the alphabet. So for every character in our alphabet, we assign a random character that maps to. So spacebar, for instance, in this example becomes J, A becomes X, B becomes N, C becomes G. So it's been shuffled. Um, and again, when you encrypt using this key, you get something that is quite hard to read. So that was successfully encrypted. Now breaking this is much harder than breaking the rotation cipher. but this is still not good enough because um, on the one hand you have um, 27 factorial keys. That's a lot of keys. You cannot try each and every one of those. Would take too much time, but there's a weakness in our cipher. Um, and this weakness is, um, if, if you take a look at our cipher text, you will notice that certain characters appear particularly frequently. For instance, the J appears quite often. Why is that? Well, because the J is spacebar, and spacebar is a common character. Um, same with X and D. X and D. X and D map to E and A. Each E and A are vowels, and vowels are much more frequent than most other characters in the English language. So, what you can do is basically just look at the distribution of characters if you have a large enough ciphertext, um, and then say with a high probability which character maps to which um, character in the plain text. This is called a statistical analysis, and um, yeah, that's the way you can easily break a substitution cipher. So, let's look at a third archaic cipher and that's a transposition cipher. Um, in the two examples before, in the rotation cipher and the substitution cipher, we were replacing one character with a specific other character. This works slightly different. In this example, we are replacing one um, position with another position. So we're not shuffling our alphabet, we're basically shuffling our text. So in this example, it just says, move the first key to the third position, move the first character to the third position, move the second character to the first position, and so on. That's because our key is 31542 in this example. So 
using this key, hello becomes eol. Eol is quite hard to read. Well, no, not really. Eol is actually relatively easy to read because it's just an anagram of hello. Um, and there we already have it how this type of cipher can be broken. Uh, you just form anagram until you find one that, that seems to make sense. And again, if you have enough cipher text, you can easily decrypt that. So, attack against transposition cipher. Just try out anagrams until one, until you find one that works. Um, yeah. So, let's jump ahead. These were archaic ciphers. They haven't been seriously used for seriously purposes in, 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 in a long time. Let's look at how this um, type of thing is achieved in modern times how modern cryptography works. Um, and um, of course, little caveat here, this is very much simplified, uh, what we're going to talk about right now. This is just supposed to give a basic overview. It's not supposed to give uh, you a comprehensive idea of how something like this can actually be built. There's a, a lot of subtleties when implementing cryptography. Um, a lot of things that you can forget to do and suddenly your entire protocol becomes unsafe. So take care. So again, we're looking at one particular example that can be used to construct modern cryptographic protocols, and that's a block cipher. There are alternatives to block ciphers, specifically there are stream ciphers, but block cipher is a particularly nice one to look at for now. Um, right. The example we're seeing here is basically AES. That's the Advanced Encryption Standard. Um, and AES is based on a substitution permutation network. Um, and this is what we can see on the right side of the slide. There are three distinct steps to a substitution permutation network. The first step is this cross in a circle. Uh, that's, that stands for XOR. Um, and XOR is actually just, equivalent XOR is equivalent to um, a rotation in binary. Um, and uh, what that does is it does not, um, it does not rotate the entire block of plain text by um, a fixed value, but it just basically comp rotates each bit by the amount indicated from the key. So um, it rotates each bit from plain text with a separate bit of key material. And then you have combined your data with a key, and now this is just sent through substitution boxes, which is basically a substitution cipher. There's a lookup table and that replaces that data with, with another value. And then the third step we can see that's this mesh, that's this graph type thing um, that shuffles the bits around. And the idea here is that when you have done that multiple times, you repeat that process a couple of times in multiple rounds. The idea here is that you end up with every bit of the cipher text being influenced by um, pretty much all bits of the plain text and of the key. So the goal kinda is if you flip one bit in the key, 50% on average statistically of the bits of the cipher text flip. Um, same with the plain text, if you flip 50% of the bits from the plain text, uh, if you flip one bit from the plain text, roughly 50% of the ciphertext bits should flip. Um, so what this does is it obscures the, um, it obscures um, the relationship between plain text key and ciphertext. So it's very, very hard to, to kind of find, um, yeah, to, to reverse that process without knowing two of those three things. Yeah, so, one thing I forgot to say is that, of course, this, this just works in blocks. That's why it's called a block cipher. You just take a fixed size block of um, plain text and encrypt that 
uh, and each block separately. Um, and to reverse that process, you just run it from bottom to top. We've just talked top to bottom. And reversing that is bottom to top because each of those operations is reversible if you know the key. Right. So, um, yeah, one thing you've got to mark is that that by itself is not secure. Um, why is that? Well, there, there are some caveats to look at. For instance, one property this particular construction has is that if you encrypt the same block of data with the same key, you'll get the same output. Why is that a problem? Well, it sometimes happens that you that you do encrypt the same block, for instance. For instance, if your data contains a lot of zeros, you will be able to see that. So you can still see some patterns of the, um, you can still see some patterns indicating what the plain text roughly looks like. Uh, and that's not good. Um, and so you can work around it, you can build more complicated protocols. Um, in this case, the mitigation you'd use is a block cipher mode that just combines the current block of data being encrypted with previous blocks, so um, you don't get the same result twice. Just keep that in mind that that's um, a fairly incomplete picture here. So now let's try to use that to build a cryptographic protocol. Um, Bertha still would like to send her a message. I like your cat ears to uh, Alice would still like to send her a message to Bertha. Um, so the first thing she has to do is she has to create a key and transmit that to Bertha. And this is the most crucial step here because the key has to be transmitted very, very securely. If the key is leaked, um, an attacker can um, read the data being transmitted. So you have to find some way to securely transmit the key, but then you can use the key again and again to send data securely. And of course, Berta can do the same. Berta can just send keys back. Uh, send, send messages back using the same key, basically. Um, there's there's still one weakness there. So now because uh, now we have encryption, but we don't really have the other two properties we want. Um, the data can still be tampered with, and Berta wouldn't notice. Or you could even send completely random data, and Berta would just decrypt it, um, and the data might look like mumbo jumbo, but um, there's no real fixed way to detect that anybody sent just random stuff. So um, we can work around, we can solve that. Um, and the solution to that is called a message authentication code. Uh, and a message authentication code just takes some sort of text, combines that again with the key, and generates a short string of data representing that key together with the text. An important thing to know here is that from the authentication tag, the text and the key cannot be recovered. So you can just generate that authentication tag and add that to your message, add some redundant data, um, and any attacker wouldn't be able to generate their own authentication tags because, um, well, they wouldn't be able to generate their authentication tags because they don't have the key. You need the key to generate the tag. So now we can just add that to our protocol. The key exchange works like before, but now Alice first encrypts her data and then runs the message authentication code on the ciphertext and then just appends the message authentication code to the ciphertext. Berta does the same in reverse. She just um, also generates the message authentication code because she has the key. Um, and if she notices that doesn't match with the message authentication text sent by Alice, then she just abhors execution. She, she just stops decrypting data and says, sorry, something went wrong, invalid data. But if the check succeeded, she can decrypt the data and we're fine. So um, if, if the message was changed in flight or if anybody was tampering with the data, um, we could detect that. 
So one thing you may notice that there is still um, there's kind of an Achilles heel in this entire construct, and that's the key transmission. Because if the key is leaked, or even if parts of the key are leaked, it makes it much easier for an attacker to decrypt the data. Um, yeah, it makes it much easier, or if the entire key is leaked, of course, the attacker can encrypt the entire data. And the, the problem here is that the key is very, is, 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 very, is very bad to work with. It's a random string of numbers. It has to be a random string of numbers for cryptographic purposes. So that's very hard to transmit. Um, you can write it down, but then you can lose the paper, and that's not very nice. You cannot use passwords because um, most cryptographic primitives um, expect a high entropy key or a high quality key, a, a key that looks very, very random. Um, and of course, a password doesn't do that. A password contains more A's than access, and that makes it unsuitable for direct use as a cryptographic key. We can do something to work around that problem. We can use a key derivation function. And um, a key derivation function just accepts key material. So that is just data containing secret data that is not very well formatted as a key. It may be too long. Um, there may be patterns in it. It may be just plain text. It may contain more A's than X's. If it contains enough entropy, um, the key derivation function will generate a high quality cryptographic key from that. So this basically enables us to transmit passwords because we can just transmit a long enough password, pass that into the key derivation function and generate a high quality key. Or we could even send multiple messages um, and just have a very, very long password um, that we put into the key derivation function because we just concatenate all the separate passwords. And if one of the messengers or if enough of the messengers get through unscathed and we actually have enough secret entropy, the resulting key will be safe. So key derivation function very, very neat for generating high quality keys to use in encryption. Let's look at how we can uh, add that to our protocol. Um, basically now Alice doesn't generate a key anymore. She just generates a password and transmits that password securely to Berta. Both insert that password into their key derivation function and now they have the same key on both sides. So yes, that is very useful. The rest of our protocol just keeps working as it did before. So having a key derivation function has improved our key handling a lot. We, we have a much easier time managing our keys, but it's, it's, it's still kind of problematic. You still need to have a trusted messenger or have some sort of very, very safe way to actually transmit the cryptographic key. And you don't really want that. So, um, it, it had to be done this way. You had to have some secure way to transmit keys until asymmetric cryptography was invented. And that is pretty cool because, um, yeah, that then basically solved that problem to, um, well, solved that problem very well. Um, in asymmetric cryptography, you don't have one key that is used to both encrypt and decrypt data. You have two keys. You have one public key that you can publish and that can that everybody can see and use and you have a secret key and um, the secret key only you keep that so personally I, I I could tell you my public key right now I could um, just print it on the screen and you can even go to my home page and uh, yeah and download my key basically and send me an encrypted email that is one of those public keys um, I can publish that, no problem. Um, I just have to keep my secret key private. So 
The public key is used to encrypt data destined for me and only the secret key can decrypt it again. Uh, there's an inverse of, or, or there's an equivalent for signatures too, for authentication, and that is called a digital signature. signature. Um, and there I can use my secret key to sign data and um, you can check the signature, check that it's really from me using my public key that's on my website. So now basically what we've done, we've reduced the difficulty of exchanging keys from we need to have a unobserved channel to transmit the keys through. We have, yeah, we have a spy free channel. We've reduced it to you just need to be sure it's, it's coming from me. And that is much easier to create. Again, think of the example of me just putting that on my, um, on my card, handing that to you. We can do that in a public space, no problem, but transmitting the key through whispering would be quite hard. So that improved things a lot. Yeah, so for most, there, there is a third kind of asymmetric cryptographic, cryptographic primitive um, and that is called um, a Diffie-Hellman key exchange. Most, connect, most cryptography nowadays is usually done on live connections. So, if you're streaming this video right now, you'd be using such a con uh, you'd be using you'd be streaming through such a connection. The connection is encrypted, um, and both parties can just send messages very very quickly. And um, so in such a scenario, we can use a Diffie-Hellman key exchange instead of the um, asymmetric encryption we've, we've talked about before. And in a Diffie-Hellman key exchange, we both just generate our um, key pairs and transmit each, each other's public key. We transmit those to each other. And then I combine my private key with your public key and you the same, just with your public key and my private key, and we'd get the same password that we can then put in a key derivation function. And the cool thing about that is just we never actually transmitted the key, we just transmitted the public keys. So that's kind of a bonus there, and a very nice property to have. Yeah. So. This is what it looks like when we build a protocol using that. We start off by using a key exchange, a Diffie-Hellman key exchange, um, have some sort of authentication algorithm going that often uses signature algorithms. Um, and then we just put the exchanged secrets, the secrets we just exchanged into our key derivation function and then encrypt data as we had before. So we just use um, asymmetric cryptography in the handshake and then use symmetric cryptography like we did before in the rest of the connection. And that is very nice because asymmetric cryptography is, is kind of slow. So we get the asymmetric, asymmetric advantages of having, to, of, of having public keys um, and private keys while getting the speed advantages of symmetric cryptography. This pretty much is what, um, this pretty much is the state of the art right now. So um, the connection you're using probably uses something like this. TLS, if it's a modern cipher, uses pretty much something that looks like this. Now, that is nice and all, um, but how do quantum computers come into play? So how can we attack that um, construct using quantum computers? There are basically two quantum strategies used today to attack cryptography, or that can be used to attack cryptography. It's not done in practice in the wild, actually. The first thing you can use is Grover's algorithm. And that's just a generic quantum search. So we talked about a brute force attack before. 
That is just trying every possible key until you find one that fits. And on a classical computer, that just takes your key space divided by two attempts. So um, imagine you have a million possible keys. A classical computer will just need 500,000 tries to find that on average. Quantum computers are faster. Quantum computers don't need key space divided by two tries. Quantum computers just need a square root of key space size tries. So for a million possible keys, quantum computers for quantum effects, I don't, I don't really understand. They just need a thousand tries to search for a key in this key space of a million keys. That is quite a bit faster, and that pretty much works on, on yeah, on on any cryptographic system, and and on any problem. It's just the quantum search algorithm. So, it's a lot faster. The nice thing here is that um, we we can mitigate that just by increasing our key size. So, um, if we want to have basically the same level of security we can just use a 12-digit um, key, a 12-decimal-digit key, um, so the quantum computer will need a million tries to find the key. And actually doubling the, com doub doubling the number of security bits, doubling your key space, is not actually that expensive. So you can pretty much just do that and you'll be fine. There is another algorithm, and a more important algorithm, that um, can be used to attack cryptographic systems. And that is Shor's algorithm. Now one thing you have to know is that all the asymmetric cryptography used today is basically based on two mathematical problems. Of the inter uh, it's based on the integer factorization problem or the discrete logarithm problem. And both of them can be solved very, very efficiently using Shor's algorithm. And because it's, of course, it's nice that these problems can be solved, but since we're using them for cryptography and since they are the basis of why our crypto is secure, why it's if the fact that it is so hard to solve those problems for a classical computer is what makes asymmetric cryptography safe. So the fact that quantum computers can solve those problems effectively means our handshake is broken. Pretty much all of modern asymmetric cryptography is broken by that style of attack. So let's take a look at how much of a problem that actually is. What do quantum computers today look like? So today you cannot seriously, you cannot use uh, quantum computers to run Shor's algorithm and attack existing cryptographic systems for the simple reasons that quantum computers are not advanced enough yet. They simply run out of memory. Quantum computer computers have something called qubits, quantum bits, um, and the big quantum computers have something like 50, 60 bits right now. Um, modern, um, yeah, modern asymmetric cryptography has a lot more bits than that, so um, they cannot be attacked. They're also very expensive and you need to cryogenically cool them so it's not practical and it's not expected to become practical to actually run these attacks in the next couple of years. However, maybe in 10 years, 20 years, it could become a serious possibility. As a government agency or any actor with a lot of money, if you want to get 
um, if you if if you want to attack existing cryptography, one thing you can do is just store the data being transmitted right now, save it and wait it out until quantum computers become practical. Um, and of course, for most data we transmit today, that is really not a, that big of a deal. The fact that your cat videos, um, YouTube videos can be um, decrypted later, that's not, uh, that, that you watching them can be decrypted in 10 years, is not a big problem. But there's some data that is important enough that you still want it to be securely encrypted in 10, 20, 30 years. For instance, think of your health data. You don't really want any attacker to be able to access your health data in 10 or 20 years. So for this data, it would be nice to have a strategy um, that works today, that is secure against attacks from quantum computers. That brings us to post-quantum cryptography. And the thing is, it doesn't really exist. Uh, well, it does exist, but it's not really um, it's not really in production yet. It's being developed. NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology in the US, is uh, running a competition to find good candidates for asymmetric quantum proof cryptography. They started a couple of years ago, around five years ago. Um, They're right now in round two. They started out with something like 90 primitives, um, and now they're down to around 26 last times at last time I checked so um, they're in the process of trying to find good algorithms to use it's not expected uh, that they will finish before before um, 2022 probably mid decade um, at the earliest so um, right now uh, yeah we just we're just looking basically for algorithms that are really secure and that are really trustworthy. But you can follow that process on the PQC forum mailing list, the post-quantum cryptography forum mailing list. Um, it's open. You can subscribe um, and just watch what's happening. It's sometimes quite interesting to read. So let's look at what there is. There is, um, of course, the key encapsulation methods. That is basically asymmetric encryption. Um, based on problems like um, learning with errors, um, error correction codes, that sort of thing. Those are just the mathematical problems that are used instead of um, discrete logarithm or integer factorization. Um, and uh, they've be actually been tried already. So um, Chrome, Google, Cloudflare, they, they built some of those primitives into TLS. Um, and tried it out. Um, the result was something called CECPQ1 and CECPQ2. They tried the um, primitives I've, I've written down here. I basically just worked. Um, I mean, the handshakes were, it, it was a bit less efficient because they added those in, in addition to the classical handshakes, but it basically just worked. Um, yeah. They are available to use. Uh, it's just not yet that clear if they'll really be secure. Um, the BSI, the German um, um, Ministry of the Interior, basically, um, they wrote a paper stating that if you, if you really want to implement post-quantum cryptography right now, you might try Proto KM and Classic McAllis. So um, if you're in Germany, uh, those may not be bad suggestions suggestions to look at, to look at so these are basically the cryptographic methods used for key exchanges of course for digital signatures there's also something um, it's not as relevant right now because digital signatures basically protect you from man in the middle attacks so basically a server intercepting the communication between you and your second party, um, opening separate connections with each, decrypting and re-encrypting again. Um, and you need to have um, practical attacks for existing digital signature algorithms right now. You need to be able to run that in attack in a couple of seconds. So 
right now we don't have quantum computers that can do that so it's not as relevant and you can't run that um, attack in the safe now decrypt later style so um, not as relevant but it's still being developed um, there are primitives suggested for that use case too so using digital signatures and key encapsulation methods you can build a fully quantum proof systems provided those um, primitives are actually secure against classical and quantum computers so I've just talked about um, that we can't really trust those algorithms yet but Google and Cloudflare tried those out in the wild so how is that possible well you don't really want to use those post quantum algorithms yet that is true because they're new and shiny and when you're doing cryptography new and shiny is uh, not something you should strive for however you can use those algorithms in conjunction with existing asymmetric cryptography primitives ideally you would like to combine those two styles of key exchanges, those two styles of signatures in such a way that the resulting protocol is as secure as the strongest of the two. So if your post-quantum algorithm is broken, no problem, you still have your classical algorithm. If the classical algorithm is broken, no problem, you still have the other algorithm as a backup. So, implementing that in such a way, building such a system, is not quite as easy as it would sound like. There is a field of study looking at how, how to build such protocols, and that is called robust combiners. And when, when you type robust combiners into your search engine of choice, and look for papers on the subject, you will find that, well, th there's a lot of papers just saying, hey, this seems like it may be a good idea, but it really is not. So don't do that. And yeah, so however, there is one combiner that is pretty much proven to work, and that is the concatenation combiner. So to combine your post-quantum algorithm with your classical algorithm for key exchanges it basically says just do both key exchanges and concatenate um, both resulting the key material from each step just concatenate those and now you think well now my key is too long I can't really use that except you can because you just pass that into your key derivation function so run both handshakes um, and put the result into your key derivation function. For signatures, it's even easier because you can just run the signatures. Um, you can just run both the signatures. Test each, and if one of them fails, consider your signature to be invalid. So that works even more easily. Now, let's take a look at how we can combine that into a functioning protocol. We just do two key exchanges um, and authenticate twice. Now, we take the entropy from both our key exchanges and pass both into our key derivation function. And then we encrypt and authenticate as we had it before. So, that's pretty much it. That is how you can construct a um, quantum hardened cryptographic protocol. Um, and if you get it right, which is kind of a big if, if you get that right, you will have a quantum, you will have a quantum hardened um, cryptographic system that uh, can be used today, pretty much. Doing that is not that easy, though. So. Now the question remains, which 
um, which primitives should you use? And the answer is, the jury is still out for that question. There is no straight answer I can give you because NIST is still running their competition um, and right now there is not a clear winner that, that we're sure is going to be um, suitable. If you insist you want to implement something today, using Classic McAllis is probably not a terrible idea. Classic McAllis was invented in the 70s, has been widely studied, um, and is believed to be safe. The problem with Classic McAllis is just that uh, it's got giant keys. Um, so for my protocol, for, for the HSM I implemented, Classic McAllis was unsuitable because it wouldn't fit into memory. Sphinx Plus for signatures is probably, well, well, it's not as old and as reliable as Classic McAllis, but Sphinx Plus is probably not a bad choice. Failing that, Frodo K, um, fa failing Classic McAllis because the signatures are too large, Frodo K um, is probably not a bad choice either. Frodo K um, has very, very large keys as well. So that's something like 10 kilobytes, but not 100 kilobytes like Classic McAllis, if I recall correctly. So how do you find an implementation? Of course, you wouldn't want to implement any of those primitives yourself. That's not a good idea. You're going to get it wrong. For the classical algorithms, Symmetric as well as asymmetric. Pretty much just use Lipsodium. Lipsodium is written to be to be very hard to abuse. Um, it's got a very constrained, very nice choice of primitives. So if, if you use one of the primitives in Lipsodium or one of the constructions in Lipsodium, it's, it's, it's hard to make a bad choice. There are other cryptographic libraries for classical algorithms out there. But a lot of those feature some outdated algorithms that are just no longer secure. So, yeah, use those at your own peril. Or actually use Lipsodium 2 at your own peril. Getting this right, uh, yeah, getting this right is hard. For uh, post quantum, uh, quantum hardened primitives, there's LibOQS, LibOpen Quantum Safe, um, and PQ Clean. Uh, and libOQS actually uses quite a few implementations from lib uh, from pqclean. In my project, I ended up using pqclean just because it would compile for the platform I was working with, and libOQS wouldn't trivially, so I just saved some time there. MUPQ is um, also implements some of those primitives. Um, it's got optimized versions for ARM, so. I didn't find those to be um, necessary because um, the system I built was memory constrained and not performance constrained. So um, using PQ Clean was nice, uh, was fine. But if you need higher performance, MUPQ might be something you could look at. To sum it up, we have our symmetric cryptography that includes, includes all block ciphers, stream ciphers, key derivation functions, message authentication codes, and so on. And those are, are ostensibly fine, just double their key size to stay secure. Asymmetric cryptography is basically broken. The existing primitives that incur includes things like RSA, DSA, Diffie-Hellman, classical Diffie-Hellman. Those are no longer secure. Um, they have to be replaced. Post-quantum algorithms exist, but they're not really trusted yet. So what you end up doing is you use post-quantum algorithms in conjunction with asymmetric classical algorithms. And if you get that right, you hopefully have a system that is quantum hardened.
Now, feel free to address any questions to me. You can send me an email, caro at capdev.net. That is K-A-R-O at C-U-P-D-E-V dot N-E-T. Or you can tweet at me at D-A-K-O-R-A-A. That's Dakora. Um, and I'll be happy to answer questions. And finally, I'd like to thank Agnes, Jane Pye, Florian, Ben, Ben, Mimi for um, helping me make this talk. And thank you for your attention and have a great evening.